Chapter 1. The Lost Life of the Heart Thirsty hearts are those whose longings have been wakened by the touch of God within them. A. W. Tozer Some years into our spiritual journey, after the waves of anticipation that mark the beginning of any pilgrimage have begun to ebb into life's middle years of service and busyness, a voice speaks to us in the midst of all we are doing. There is something missing in all of this, it suggests. There is something more. The voice often comes in the middle of the night or the early hours of the morning, when our hearts are most unedited and vulnerable. At first, we mistake the source of this voice and assume it's just our imagination. We fluff up our pillow, roll over, and go back to sleep. Days, weeks, even months go by, and the voice speaks to us again. Aren't you thirsty? Listen to your heart. There is something missing. We listen, and we are aware of... a sigh. And under the sigh is something dangerous, something that feels adulterous and disloyal to the religion we are serving. We sense a passion deep within that threatens a total disregard for the program we are living. It feels reckless, wild. Unsettled, we turn and walk quickly away, like a woman who feels more than she wants to when her eyes meet those of a man, not her husband. We tell ourselves that this small, passionate voice is an intruder who has gained entry because we have not been diligent enough in practicing our religion. Our pastor seems to agree with this assessment and exhorts us from the pulpit to be more faithful. We try to silence the voice with outward activity, redoubling our efforts at Christian service. We join a small group and read a book on establishing a more effective prayer life. We train to be part of a church evangelism team. We tell ourselves that the malaise of spirit we feel, even as we step up our religious activity, is a sign of spiritual immaturity, and we scold our heart for its lack of fervor. Sometime later, the voice in our heart dares to speak to us again, more insistently this time. Listen to me. There is something missing in all this. You long to be in a love affair, an adventure. You were made for something more. You know it. When the young prophet Samuel heard the voice of God calling to him in the night, he had the counsel from his priestly mentor, Eli, to tell him how to respond. Even so, it took them three times to realize it was God calling. Rather than ignoring the voice or rebuking it, Samuel finally listened. In our modern, pragmatic world, we often have no such mentor, so we do not understand it is God speaking to us in our heart. Having so long been out of touch with our deepest longing, we fail to recognize the voice and the one who is calling to us through it. Frustrated by our heart's continuing sabotage of a dutiful Christian life, some of us silence the voice by locking our heart away in the attic, feeding it only the bread and water of duty and obligation until it is almost dead, the voice now small and weak. But sometimes in the night, when our defenses are down, we still hear it call to us, oh so faintly, a distant whisper. Come morning, the new day's activities scream for our attention, and the sound of the cry is gone, and we congratulate ourselves on finally overcoming the flesh. Others of us agree to give our heart a life on the side, if only it will leave us alone and not rock the boat. We try to lose ourselves in our work or get a hobby, either of which soon begin to feel like an addiction. We have an affair or develop a colorful fantasy life fed by dime store romances or pornography. We learn to enjoy the juicy intrigues and secrets of gossip. We make sure to maintain enough distance between ourselves and others and even between ourselves and our own heart to keep hidden the practical agnosticism we are living now that our inner life has been divorced from our outer life. Having thus appeased our heart, we nonetheless are forced to give up our spiritual journey because our heart will no longer come with us. It is bound up in the little indulgences we feed it to keep it at bay. Losing Heart The life of the heart is a place of great mystery. Yet we have many expressions to help us express this flame of the human soul. We describe a person without compassion as heartless, and we urge him or her to have a heart. Our deepest hurts we call heartaches. 
Jilted lovers are broken-hearted. Courageous soldiers are brave-hearted. The truly evil are black-hearted. And saints have hearts of gold. If we need to speak at the most intimate level, we ask for a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Light-hearted is how we feel on vacation. And when we love someone as truly as we may, we love with all our heart. But when we lose our passion for life, when a deadness sets in which we cannot seem to shake, we confess, my heart's just not in it. In the end, it doesn't matter how well we have performed or what we have accomplished. A life without heart is not worth living. For out of this wellspring of our soul flows all true caring and all meaningful work, all real worship and all sacrifice. Our faith, hope, and love issue from this fount as well. Because it is in our heart that we first hear the voice of God, and it is in our heart that we come to know Him and learn to live in His love. So you can see that to lose heart is to lose everything. And a loss of heart best describes most men and women in our day. It isn't just the addictions and affairs and depression and heartaches, though. God knows there is enough of these to cause even the best of us to lose heart. But there is the busyness, the drivenness, the fact that most of us are living merely to survive. Beneath it, we feel restless, weary, and vulnerable. Indeed, the many forces driving modern life have not only assaulted the life of our heart, they have also dismantled the heart's habitat, that geography of mystery and transcendence we knew so well as children. I, Brent, remember sitting in my college zoology class as my professor expounded with upraised arms the perspiration-stained underarms of his shirt proudly exposed, that man's basic problem was that he wanted to smell, or be, like a flower instead of a mammal. In physics class, the professor seemed to take satisfaction in explaining to us that the beauty of sunsets and rainbows was due only to the refraction of light through water and dust particles in the air. It was as if the miracle of light itself were somehow done away with by these explanations. I remember leaving those professors of the age of reason with a sense of loss, a sense of, oh, so that's all it is. The message of my teachers was clear. Once we dispense with unhelpful mysticism and superstition, the progress of mankind will proceed unhindered. All of us have had that experience at one time or another, whether it be as we walked away from our teachers, our parents, a church service, or sexual intimacy, the sense that something important, perhaps the only thing important, had been explained away or tarnished and lost to us forever. Sometimes, little by little, sometimes in large chunks, life has appropriated the terrain meant to sustain and nourish the more wild life of the heart, forcing it to retreat as an endangered species into smaller, more secluded, and often darker geographies for its survival. As this has happened, something has been lost, something vital. For what shall we do when we wake one day to find we have lost touch with our heart and with it the very refuge where God's presence resides? Starting very early, life has taught all of us to ignore and distrust the deepest yearnings of our heart. Life, for the most part, teaches us to suppress our longing and live only in the external world where efficiency and performance are everything. We have learned from parents and peers at school, at work, and even from our spiritual mentors, that something else is wanted from us other than our heart, which is to say, that which is most deeply us. Very seldom are we ever invited to live out of our heart. If we are wanted, we are often wanted for what we can offer functionally. If rich, we are honored for our wealth. If beautiful, for our looks. If intelligent, for our brains. So we learn to offer only those parts of us that are approved, living out a carefully crafted performance to gain acceptance from those who represent life to us. We divorce ourselves from our heart and begin to live a double life. Frederick Beekner expresses this phenomenon in his biographical work, Telling Secrets. Our original, shimmering self gets buried so deep we hardly live out of it at all. Rather, we learn to live out of all the other selves which we are constantly putting on and taking off, like coats and hats against the world's weather. On the outside, there is the external story of our lives. This is the life everyone sees, 
Our life of work and play and church, of family and friends, paying bills, and growing older. Our external story is where we carve out the identity most others know. It is the place where we have learned to label each other in a way that implies we have reached our final destination. Bob is an accountant. Mary works for the government. Ted is an attorney. The Smiths are the family with the well-kept lawn and lovely children. The Joneses are the family whose children are always in trouble. Here, busyness substitutes for meaning. Efficiency substitutes for creativity. And functional relationships substitute for love. In the outer life we live from ought, I ought to do this, rather than from desire, I want to do this. And management substitutes for mystery. There are three steps to a happy marriage, five ways to improve your portfolio, and seven habits for success. There is a spiritual dimension to this external world in our desire to do good works, but communion with God is replaced by activity for God. There is little time in this outer world for deep questions. Given the right plan, everything in life can be managed. Accept your heart.